Good morning. We glad to have you out on a wintry weekend in April. But um, hopefully that balmy springtime will get here and and we'll have some better weather along the way. Uh, it is good to be here this morning, and it was great to be at our pastor's retreat last uh, weekend and our pastoral staff to be able to be there and to just soak up some ministry ourselves and be ministered to. And, and we appreciate that time that we were able to be away. Um, and as uh, Pastor Seven has said, we're, we're getting ready for our missionary convention, our weekend. In two weeks from today, we'll have a missionary here with us. And um, in these two weeks leading up to that, I just want to spend a little bit of time, as I try to do every year, in uh, getting our mind focused and, and reminded of the mission that we are called to be a part of. Um, I just think as we were praying there and looking at this family on the screen, and uh, every month we, or every week we put up uh, one of our mission families, and uh, sometimes they're just a a picture up there and and we don't connect, but uh, it's amazing what this family has done and some of us have had the privilege of of being there in that country. It's a closed country, a communist country. Uh, The church is underground. And um, to, to see what they are doing in reaching that country for the Lord and that we have the wonderful privilege of being a part of that. And every month as we receive our missions giving, it goes to help them and the other missionaries that are doing things that we're not able to do in fulfilling the Great Commission. And so it's in that mindset that we are sharing with you this morning. And um, our, our topic this morning is how big is your God? We just sang a few minutes ago the song Our God and how awesome he is and how big he is and how wonderful he is and how strong he is. How big is your God? Hmm? Can you begin to quantify him in the, at least in the measure of what you have seen him do? Maybe we need to put with that a qualifier that says how big is your faith in God? We talked, uh, or we sang a song also about faith and about how God is faithful and we celebrate that God is faithful and we want a God that is faithful, a God that will be there when we need him and will be there to see us through those hard and difficult times of life. But do you also know that he wants followers that are faithful? How big is your faith? in God. What does God want to do through you? Do you ever think about that? What does God want to accomplish in your life, through your life, because you are willing to be his hands and feet? As I said, in two weeks we're going to be having our missionary convention, and some of you are new to our fellowship or have maybe started coming since last year. And you've heard us talk about faith promise, and every month we, we receive it the last Sunday of the month in our regular offering, and we tell you to make sure you note it that it's for faith promise. And, and we, once a year, we renew a commitment in which we, as a church, commit and then individually make that commitment possible to be able to be a part of what God is doing around the world in planting new churches and reaching out into areas of of taking the gospel uh, to others. We began this around 24 years ago here at Hyde Wesleyan. And uh, I remember that first time very well because we had a goal of $1,000. And um, that $1,000 goal seemed insurmountable at that time. We had a total church operating budget for the year of roughly $14,000. And so we tried to make everything happen with that, including paying the pastor. <laughs> and, um, uh, and so having $1,000 that was going just seemed insurmountable. 
But we challenged our people and at that time uh, believed God and when we received that first faith promise, we had promised with God's help after asking him what he wanted to do through us to give $3,600. And I remember thinking at that time, I don't know if it was that year that I thought it or, or, or in early subsequent years, but I remember thinking, wouldn't it be something if Hyde Wesleyan was able to give a million dollars to missions? Wouldn't that be great? A little over five years ago, we passed that marker of a million dollars that we had given to missions. Now we're pushing on two million dollars in which we will have given to missions uh, through just asking God, what do you want to do through us? This idea of faith promise, which may be new to some of you, is something that, a concept that a pastor in uh, Toronto, Canada, uh, came up with uh, uh, several years ago. And this is our, these are the missionaries that we support um, around the world. But his name is Oswald J. Smith. And he pastors what is called the People's Church in Toronto, Canada. And God began to lay a burden on his heart to reach the world, to do something about the fact that there are so many lost people and what can we do here in North America? And as he began to pray, God began to put this concept that we have just kind of taken and used and also used also here at Hyde Wesleyan. But his, uh, uh, for over six, uh, almost 70 years now, he has, that church, he's passed, but that church has continued giving to missions. And, uh, and today, they give over 60% of all of their income, all that is given through People's Church, goes to missions. Uh, and God has blessed them tremendously. He is a man that uh, has many quotes that people have quoted. I'm just going to share a couple quotes with you just to make you think a little bit. But here's one that he says, if God wills the evangelization of the world, if that's God's will, and I refuse to support missions, then I'm opposed to God's will. If that's what he really wants, and I say no, then I'm saying no to what God wills. Uh, He said this, attempt great things for God and expect great things from God. I think our expectation of what God can do today is so limited to what we think we can do. He said, why should anyone hear the gospel twice before everyone has heard it once? It would probably stagger us this morning if we were able to somehow calculate how many times collectively we have heard the gospel. How many of you know how many times you've heard the gospel message? How many, how many sermons have you heard from the day you were born till now? And if we would add that all together, it would boggle our mind. And yet there are people living on this world that are going to stand before God that have never heard that Jesus died for their sins. That do not know a single Christian in their whole context. And, and yet um, we've heard it over and over He also said, the mission of the church is missions. The supreme task is the evangelization of the world. And the basis for his thinking in in, in bringing out the faith promise concept comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And here the Paul was speaking to the church in in Corinth and challenging them because they had made a commitment to help the church in Jerusalem the year before. And, And this is what he said, for I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints and they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. Today and tomorrow, or next Sunday, I just want to help us to to get a fresh handle and for some of you get a new handle on what it means and how we can participate with God on mission to what he is trying to do in this world. 
To help us this morning, we're going to go to an Old Testament story. It is found in the book of of, uh, 1 Samuel, uh, chapter 1, and it is the story of uh, Elkanah and Hannah. And we're going to go to the end of that chapter and get the end of it, and then we're going to work our way back through uh, that chapter. But this is what the end says. They first butchered the bull, then brought the child to Eli, And Hannah said, excuse me, sir, would you believe that I'm the very woman who was standing before you at this very spot praying to God? I prayed for this child, and God gave me what I asked for, and now I have dedicated him to God. He is dedicated to God for life. Then and there, they worshiped God. Hannah was her name, and she was miserable. She was miserable. It, as was custom in those days in the Old Testament long ago, polygamy was a part of their culture. And um, uh, her husband, Elkanah, had two wives. She was Hannah, and her, the other wife was Penina. And um, their home life wasn't so pleasant. You see, Penina, the other wife, had children by Elkanah. And in that culture, it was very important for a woman to bear children for her husband. And if she didn't, it was like she wasn't fulfilling what she should have been doing. And, and, and in that culture, she was looked on with shame. And not only did she not bear children and carry that stigma, but it says that her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her about the fact that she didn't have children. And Penina did have the children. And because of that, uh, she felt she had more favor with Elkanah. And year after year, this went on. It seemed to especially show its ugly head when they would once a year make a pilgrimage to worship at Shiloh where the tabernacle was, uh, And for whatever reason, during that time, this came to a head. Uh, And her husband loved her. And he tried to be faithful to her. In fact, the Bible says when they went up to make sacrifice, he would give her a double portion uh, to to make sacrifice to God with. Uh, And every year, Hannah would weep. And she would not eat during this time of sacrifice. And in verse 8, it says that her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why won't you eat? Why are you downhearted? And he knew what it was from. And he says, don't I mean more to you than if you had 10 sons? The story that we want to focus in on today is the day that every, or the year that everything changed. Hannah connected with God on this trip to Shiloh, and things changed for her in a very dramatic way. And you can read it almost like a a good novel of suspense and and, and tension and, and conflict and how God helped to resolve it. The Bible says that she stood up when her family had gathered to eat there at Shiloh, and she slipped away to the tabernacle, to the sanctuary. And there was the old priest Eli who was there sitting at the entrance and watched as this woman came and wept bitterly, pouring out her heart to the Lord. And in this process, we begin to see some of the dynamics of the whole thing that we're talking about in Faith Promise. And she began to ask God for something specific and began to claim what only God could do and accepted what God gave, and then gave it back to him. So let's look at this. Faith promise is requesting something from God. It's coming to God and with, a, with, a, with a definite ask. And in fact, uh, she asked particularly. She said, oh God of angel armies, if you'll take a good hard look at my pain, if you'll quit neglecting me and go into action by giving me a son. She desired a particular thing. 
and she made a particular ask. You know, God delights in giving us what we ask for, especially when what we ask for is in keeping with his will, in keeping with what he has planned for our lives and through our lives. And God had a plan for Hannah. In fact, her son, who later grew up to be the boy, the man, the leader, Samuel, was so instrumental in the founding of that Jewish nation. And God had a plan, and she asked, uh, and she asked not just for a child, uh, but she said, God, I want a boy. How big is your faith? How big is your faith in asking God for things that seem to be impossible? So she asked particularly, but she also asked purposefully. She said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm asking you this, God, so that I can do this, that I will give him completely and unreservedly to you. I'll set him apart for a life of holy discipline. Now, Hannah was talking here about giving her son back to God. Not figuratively, but literally. You know, many times throughout the year as we have new babies and parents want to dedicate their children to the Lord, we have them come down front. And I take that child in my arms and I I pray God's blessing upon them and lead that family in dedicating that child to God. And then I give that child back to mom and dad. Cindy and I do not take them home. We had three And that was enough, all right? But this was not a figurative uh, dedication to the Lord. This was literal. She was bringing him, or would bring, and subsequently, would bring this child and give him to the Lord to be raised at the tabernacle. Her desire was to have a son that would serve God all the days of his life, Uh, Let me ask you something. How many of you have asked God for something this week? You prayed and you asked him for something. And the rest of you didn't pray this week because when we pray, we're always asking him for something, aren't we? Oh Lord, would you please uh, touch my body? Lord, you know this thing that I need and Lord, uh, uh, I, I have this problem that I need you to fix and Lord, I'm in this jam, would you get me out of this jam? Lord, this person is not working well with me, would you please do something about it? We're praying all the time, asking God to do certain things for ourselves. In reality, we're a very consumer-driven Christianity here in the West in which we kind of look at God as the God who will supply all my needs, yes. And Lord, here is the list. And here, Lord, in fact, I can get a couple lists for you if you can't get, if that's that's not much for you, you can, here's more. We never run out of things that we want God to do for ourselves. We don't have any problem asking God to help us. Yet, many of us never have ever asked God that out of his abundance, he would do something through me to reach, to accomplish the mission that he has at the very heart of who he is that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to the world to accomplish, and that was to save a world that was lost, that was on their way into eternity without God, that would be separated from God forever. How many times this week have you prayed, oh God, would you through me reach my world for Jesus? We find it easy to pray for God to give me, give me, give me, give me. And in relation to our faith promise, the the monetary aspect of this, I can't ever remember anybody coming to me and saying, Bob, would you please join me in prayer or here's my prayer request. You know, my faith promise is due this month. It's going to be the offering next week and I don't have the funds yet. Would you pray that God would supply the funds and by next week we would somehow be able to meet that promise that we made? 
But I have heard people that have come to me and said, well, Bob, I'm not gonna be able to give my faith promise money because I just don't have the money this month. And I always say, well, that's between you and God, not between you and me. Our purpose in asking God what he wants to give through us is that we would become the channel through which God would reach the world and fulfill the command that he gave us to go into all the world and preach the gospel up. Faith promise is a promise that allows God to give a specific amount. We commit to that as individuals, and that's what we ask you to do as, as, as you prepare for this. But it's not necessarily money that we have. I'm not saying reach into your pocket and see how much money you have, but I'm just asking you, would you be willing to, to ask God what he wanted to do through you? Money that God wants to give, that God wants to provide, or help you discover within your own life that we become just the delivery service for him to be able to accomplish this task of reaching our world. So many times, instead of a faith promise, we treat it like a pledge. And the pledge is basically looking at our resources and saying, okay, I can do this much, I can give this much to to uh, whatever charity that it is that you may, may want to give to. And you say, out of what I have, this is what I can do. Uh, but it is much more than that. We are looking at God and saying, God, what do you want to do? And what God wants to do is so much bigger than what I want to do. So real faith promise has nothing to do with our resources, but has everything to do with God's resources. Uh, and that being true then every single person can participate in this because all you have to do is say, I'm willing, God, if you are willing, what do you want to do? What do you want to give to world missions through me? So it's all about how big is my faith in God? How big is my faith in God? And then it means that we ask persistently. It says there in verse 12 that it happened that As she continued in prayer before God, Eli was watching her closely. She continued, and she had continued, and she had continued, not only this time there, but every year she would pour out her heart to God. Sometimes we ask God for something and then we just forget about it because we don't see it right away. Hannah prayed year after year. And this week, as I'm asking you, and we have been for the last couple weeks, asking you to pray and ask the question, what does God want to give through you? And it's not, none of this stays here, okay? We are asking for the world. We are asking for the lost. We are asking for those people that do not have a church yet, that churches are gonna be planted and the gospel is going to be taken to the world. What does God want to give through me to make that happen? The second thing that I find here, faith promise is relying on God to answer. Faith promise is an opportunity for me as a family to trust God in a way that is going to increase my faith and make it possible for God to do even other things that I never would have trusted him before, except that I had already learned to trust him in this area. And it leads me to develop and grow my faith. Hannah here, as she prayed, she found out that God was the only one that could answer. There's only one God. Hannah, her hus- or Hannah's husband, Elkanah, had tried his best to meet her need. He loved her. He felt sorry for her. He tried to make up for the fact that she didn't have a child. He gave her a double portion. And it was all well-meaning and well-meant, but only God could answer the request that was on Hannah's heart. Let me ask you something. Have you ever believed God for something that only he could do? Think about that in your life. Have you ever believed God for something only he could do? and then saw him do it. If you did, you know what that does to your faith. You know how that strengthens you and strengthens your relationship with God and strengthens you to do and to be things that you never thought could happen in your life. Uh, 
Not only did, was, did she understand that God was the only one, that he was, could supply exactly what she needed. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul says, but my God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ. We trust him for what it is that he and I together agree. This is what God, we want, I want you to be able to do through me. And then it's not a matter of me figuring it out, of me having to necessarily come up with the answer. But I trust God to do it. Last year, my wife and I increased our giving by $100 a month. And it was a year in which we, you know, bought our first house. All those expenses. And it's been amazing how God has provided it in ways that I haven't always thought. But every month, it's been there to be able to meet the need in which God and us have committed to do. So it's not a matter of me figuring it out. Sometimes when I try to figure out, I can really mess it up. Just ask Abraham. You know, Abraham, God said, I'll give you a son. And Abraham and Sarah didn't have any children. They're going to up in years, pushing 100. And what are we going to do? And so, well, take my maidservant. Have a child by her. That must be what God wants. And to this day, we feel the repercussion of that as the lineage of that child are the Arabs. And the lineage of the child that God wanted them to have are the Jews. And the conflict that has been there because they just didn't trust God to work it out in his way. And so we have to trust God to be able to do what he has promised to do. And then faith promise is receiving the answer. In verse 12, it says, It happened that as she continued in prayer before God, Eli was watching her closely. Hannah was praying in her heart silently. Her lips moved, but no sound was heard. Eli jumped to the conclusion that she was drunk. And he approached her and said, You're drunk. How long do you plan to keep this up? Sober up, woman. And Hannah said, Oh, no, sir. Please. I am a woman hard used. I haven't been drinking, not a drop of wine or beer. The only thing I've been pouring out is my heart, pouring it out to God. She had been pouring out her heart to God with this need, and when she prayed, she was believing, and and she was trusting that God would hear her. And we must believe, we must believe that God is going to answer that prayer, huh? And to do what she was incapable, she could not do anything about this problem other than trust God. And then faith promises when God answers to return it to God. It says, before the year was out, Hannah had conceived and gave birth to a son. She had one desire, to have a son that she could give totally to God. And now her son was there. Her son was the answer, the direct answer to that specific, particular, purposeful prayer. And she, with grace, gives back to God what was given to her. She not only returned it with grace, but she returned it with gladness. It says says there in the next verse, Elkanah said to his wife, do what you think is best. Stay home until you have weaned him. Yes, let God complete what he has begun. So she did. She stayed home and nursed her son until he had we- she had weaned him. Then she took him up to Shiloh when they made their annual pilgrimage, bringing also the makings of a generous sacrificial meal, a prized bowl, flour, and wine. The child was so young to be sent off. And then we reach that part that we started with. They first butchered the bull. Then brought the child to Eli, and Hannah said, Excuse me, sir, would you believe that I'm the very woman who was standing before you at this very spot, praying to God? I prayed for this child, and God gave me what I asked for. And now I have dedicated him to God. He's dedicated to God for life. Then and there, they worshiped God. What a great story of what God wants to give us and give to create 
the fulfillment of his purpose. Sometimes when God gives us things, we hold on to them so tightly because why? They're mine or that's what we think. Not realizing that everything that we have belongs to God. It all belongs to him. We are just, we are just stewards of what he has allowed us to have in this life. And he's gonna ask us one day, what have you done with it? Uh, but her grateful and obedient heart led her to give back completely to God what God had given to, him, to her. In, in 2 Corinthians it says this, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Every man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, God will provide. A friend that I went to school with in college shared a story about a faith promise incident in his life. He was telling about a time in which he was pastoring a church and their church had made a faith promise commitment. And the way they did it, they, they had made this commitment and then they must have had 10 times throughout the year in which they would give 10% of that commitment. And so, the first 10% Sunday was coming up. And um, uh, he one day received a envelope in the mail. And it was from a church that he had done some work for a year ago. He had helped this church who had, they were building a building and needed some graphic work done and uh, a brochure printed up. And they had asked him, because of his abilities, if he would pro provide that, do that for them. And at the time, that pastor had told him, and, and when you do, we'll, we'll give you something for it. Well, a year had gone by. They had raised their money, and um, he had never heard from them. And that was okay with him because... He was doing it for the Lord's work and he just kind of forgot about it. But there, this morning, there was an envelope from that church and he opened it up and when he opened it up, there was a check for $500. Now, that was a lot of money. And immediately he thought, oh wow, isn't this great? And he immediately began to think about some things that he had had dreams of. He was wanting to buy a new guitar. And there was also, he wanted a new gun. And there were several other things, and just the idea of having some money in the fun fun would have been good. And he went to the, was on the way to the bank and pulled up to the window to cash the check. And while he was waiting there at the window, God began to have a, cons a, a, a conversation with him. And he said, God just impressed upon his heart, uh, is that your money? In two weeks is this offering that you made a commitment to that with my help, you will pay, provide the first 10% in two weeks. Do you know what his commitment was for? $5,000. 10% is how much? $500. And he said, that's what this is about. I have provided that for you. Through a, uh, you forgot all about that. It wasn't a part of your financial structure for the year or for the week. And here it is, and you're, you're off to buy a gun, to buy a guitar. And he said, God just reinforced to him, I will provide, just trust me. God will provide if we ask him to exactly what it is that he and you come to an agreement on. As I said, it's not a pledge. It's not legally binding. In fact, those of you that are new that haven't been a part of this, there's no place for you to sign your name. It's not between you and me, not between you and the church, it's between you and God. And so we just ask you, ask God what he wants to give to missions through you. And then you and him, work it out. He will provide 
Our goal this year is $100,000. Our average attendance is somewhere around 265 people on average on a Sunday morning. If we would divide that up, that's $377 per person or $7.25 a month. And the purpose as it is, I said, is not to buy new chairs or clean the furniture or anything else. It's to help take the gospel to the world. And we support these missionaries and the projects that they're a part of. And the total of it goes to those needs. Uh, And we look at that and we say, $100,000, that's a lot of money, Bob. It is. But we think of how much money goes through our fingers in a year. I just did a quick run yesterday of asking Google, how much does the average American spend on bottled water? And Google tells me, and I've checked it out in several sources, $100 a person per year on average, Americans spend on bottled water. Family of four, that's 400 bucks. How much do they spend on soft drinks, soda, pop, whatever you wanna call it? $850 a family per year. So an average family, an American family, spends roughly over $1,200 on just bottled water and pop, okay? There's more than 100 families that are a part of our church family. If every family would just spend what the average American, take what an average American spends on bottled water and pop, we can meet our goal of what God is asking us as a church to do to reach the world. You say, well, Bob, I've gotta have my bottled water. I can't drink that tap water. It tastes awful. And maybe it does to our palate. But I have stood at the dried up creek bed, river bed, where there are little pools of water still there and a little trickle coming down. And those little pools of water are covered with green slime. Goats had been in there just a few moments ago and watched women come down with five gallon bucket containers put it down there in the water and begin to fill it up. Put it on their head. Climb up out of that creek bank, up across the field and walk maybe a mile or two to their home to take water for their people. And we say, well, I can't give up mine. I'm just saying there's some things in our life that we have come to just say, oh, this is what we have to have, that we really don't have to have. But if we would just make slight adjustments, we could make a world of difference. You know, every Sunday we receive that change and, oh, it's, it's fun for us. The kids love it. But it makes a world of difference for those children in that orphanage in Swaziland. And it doesn't seem like a lot of money, but Mrs. Twyla has told me more than once, Bob, that's what keeps us open is what Hyde sends us. Four or $5,000 a year, helping them to have a different life. I just ask you, will you over these two weeks join me and ask God, what do you want to give through missions through me this year? And all I ask of you is that you have that conversation. And whatever God says is between you and him And I believe, though, that if all of us ask that conversation, God will help us to be able to do what we have promised as a church. This is what we feel God wants us to do. As we push forward in joining with these that have gone, I think of several years ago, We were, at this time of the year, and Brian and Tammy were getting ready to go to Swaziland for a year. And I think our goal was 80 some some thousand dollars. And I challenged this church family. They needed 20,000 more. And we had that 80 some thousand already committed to our missionaries that we were already supporting. And I challenged our family, 
to say, whatever comes in above that that 80 some thousand will go to Brian and Tammy to help them to go to the mission field. And that year, we took in almost 25, 30,000 almost over our goal and were able to fully fund them to go. It's possible. God can do through us all that needs to be done. I just had a missionary call me this week, one that I would love to help support. Kevin Austin, who served with my brother in, in the Czech Republic and have been home for a number of years, and they came to the old church and visited years ago. But they're returning to the Czech Republic. And I get many calls from missionaries that want support. And you can't support everybody. And you have the, we, we're committed to the ones that we have uh, taken on, and we have kind of a policy of we'll support them as long as they're on the mission field. We'll try to keep up our support. And it's just hard to be able to you know, say, okay, this is where we're at, and if we get 100,000, that means that we're fully funding what we have now. And Kevin, I'll keep you in mind, but we'll see where we are afterwards. Um, I'm not saying that we have to support every missionary that is going out, but God wants us to be a part of what he is doing around the world. The church is... is is just blossoming in some places around the world. In America, the church on the whole is dying. On the whole, the church every year, every year in America, we're closing more churches than we're planting. In some places in the world, it is just they can't keep up with the people that are coming to the Lord. And we kind of live in our bubble and don't even know what is happening in some of these places around the world. And the least we can do is enable those who said, yes, I'll go and be a part of that. And that's what we're talking about. That's what we're challenging you to. And that's what we're asking you to pray about. Again, this prayer is between you and God. Whatever you and God decide is perfectly fine with us because we want what God wants and what he wants in your life too. All right, well, I trust that God will take this and will chew on it this week and pray about it and see what God has for us in two weeks when we gather together for our missions weekend. Would you stand with me? And um, we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. And as we go, again, if we could have help taking down those chairs, we would appreciate it. And the board, if you would meet with me in classroom two, we will be there in just a couple minutes. Father God, we thank you this morning for your faithfulness. Thank you for all that you have chosen to do with us and through us up till now. Lord, we're amazed at what this church family has done, what you have done through us. Lord, we just pray that our best days would be ahead. We believe, dear Lord, that it isn't um, coincidental that just a couple weeks ago we burned our mortgage that you so generously have given through this congregation and that we have seen our own needs met. Lord, we pray that you will continue to use us as we meet the needs of those who are going to take the gospel. And so, Lord, we pray that in these weeks that we have this conversation with you, that our ears would be tuned to you to hear what it is you want to say to us. We ask us, ask you to help us to be obedient. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.